Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at Cherry Hill Presbyterian Church. Please note that all three of the hymns in today's service may be found in the red and covered hymnals before you. Please join me in the call to worship as it appears in the fold. No one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ, for it stands in Scripture. See, I have laid inside the stone.
from everlasting to everlasting. God's anger is cut for a moment, but God's forgiveness and grace knows no limits. Therefore, trusting in God's mercy, God's forgiveness, and God's grace, let us bring before God our prayers of confession. Let us pray. Almighty Lord, no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. We admit that we have not been able to finish building on this foundation in such a way that we may become the dwelling place of God. We have sometimes even been the cause of this world. Forgive us and give us power to dig deeply into your life, to establish those foundations that can endure the storms of this world. By your Holy Spirit, grant us forgiveness, not only in words, but also in deeds.
Just will take a minute and see if I just want to sit down. <laughs> Before I give you your Bibles this morning on behalf of the congregation, I want to tell you just a little story about today. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a little girl. Her name was Lori. You don't know Lori. I don't know Lori. Some people in the church know Lori. Lori's sister, Marcy, is up on the balcony. We could wave to Marcy. Lori's mother, Isa Osborne, is home watching us on Facebook. We could look up at the camera and wave to Isa And Lori loved coming to church on Sunday mornings. More than that, Lori loved coming to Sunday school. Just like I'm sure you love coming to Sunday school. In fact, one of Lori's Sunday school teachers, Mrs. Brown, is back there. We can wave Mrs. Brown. Hi, Mrs. Brown. <laughs> Mrs. Brown is Lori's Sunday school teacher. And not only did Lori love coming to Sunday school, she loved bringing her Bible with her on Sunday mornings to Sunday school. Wonderful. Well, one Sunday morning, as Lori and her parents were coming to church, Lori sadly got sick. And very sadly, Lori died. But Lori's parents, because she loved Sunday school so much, and because she loved the Bible, her Bible so much, Lori's parents made a wonderful gift to the church, which to this very day, to the Bible we receive today provides Bibles for all the kids, all the children in our church. So today, you get to receive this Bible as a gift from the congregation, as a gift from Lori's mom and dad. And I would say, I would encourage you, as you get your Bibles today, to take it home, read it. If you have questions, ask your Sunday school teacher. They have all the answers you'll ever need. I'm not real sure who's teaching today, but and oh, it's Josh. Your Sunday school teacher has all the answers. And he's like me. If he doesn't know the answer, he'll make it. But most of all, I hope that as you grow, you'll, you'll read the Bible more and more. And I hope that you'll remember Lori, a very special person. Love Sunday school, love the Bible, love God, and maybe someday you'll pass on this gift to someone else as well. So, I have your Bibles for you. Receive this gift from all of us to you, and may each and every day may you learn and grow, as I say each week, may you learn and grow in God's love and in God's grace. Now, the congregation has something very special to say to you before you leave. So, I invite the four of you sitting here to please stand. So, Alexander, Elijah, and Max, and Jacob. Receive these gifts as a gift, these Bibles as a gift from your church family. Learn the stories in this Bible. Study its words. The Bible stories belong to us all, and the words in the Bible speak to us. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another, for we are the people of God. We rejoice in this step in your journey with God. We pray to God who will guide you, your family, and us as you use this holy Bible alone in your church school classes and in our worship. We will learn together and grow up with our love for God's word. Thank you. So now you're excused for Sunday school, and any other children who are present are excused as well to meet with Josh. Though I'm sure it has all the answers for this one.
Once again, good morning and welcome to Cherry Hill Presbyterian Church on this beautiful spring, almost summer-like morning. Whether you worship with us here in the sanctuary or if you are joining us for worship today through our live stream broadcast, we pray that you might experience a new joy and a new strength for the living of these days. If you are here in the sanctuary, I would invite you to please take the red friendship pads, which are at both ends of the pews. Let us know of your presence. If you're worshiping with us online, please let us know by commenting on, on, on Facebook to let us know that you're with us as well. We, we continue to hear from a growing number of people each week, and it's nice to know that others are joining with us at this time. Regretfully, there will be no coffee hour this morning, so you're invited to visit with one another here in the sanctuary of foyer or outside following the service. Coming up in June, you will note in the bulletin that on Tuesday, June the 6th, we are hosting a CPR class here at the church. Uh, there's more information about the class in the bulletin. There is a sign-up sheet on the table in the report. Uh, if you need to renew your CPR certification, never been certified, we would invite you to consider attending this training session. Uh, there is no charge. We just simply need to know who is planning on attending. That's Tuesday, June the 6th at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. And again, the sign up sheet is in your report. This morning, we have a special uh, announcement, and I would invite Anna Dewey to come forward at this time. Uh, you've probably been reading his bulletin in the newsletter the past couple of weeks about two special uh, discussion groups that we have the privilege of being part of. And I ask Anna to share a bit more with us. Thank you, Anna. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here to personally invite you to our Engage Movie and Book Groups. I'm very grateful to former Little Field member Bob Stead, who started all of this over five years ago. In 2016, Bob formed a book group, and in his words, its purpose was to engage with fiction and nonfiction works, which challenge us to be God's witnesses in a world worth saving. We call the group Engage with an exclamation, exclamation mark to remind us that we need to be engaged in the text, engaged in the times, engaged in each other's concerns, and engaged in making God's presence known and felt in the world. It's been beautiful to witness how the group has indeed done this. We've challenged ourselves to read important and often difficult texts that have sparked difficult but important conversations, all that can occur in the same space. It's very open and informal. No one is the expert, but we are all there as lifelong learners and growing for social justice and change. The group has read texts like Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, The 57 Bus by Dasha Slater, Killers of the Flower Moon by David Graham, America's Original Sin by Reverend Jim Wallace, and about 20 others. The group meets on Zoom for an hour every other month on the fourth Monday to discuss the newly chosen book. For May 23rd, the group will be discussing How Beautiful We Were by Mbolo Mbowe. In 2020, one of the engaged book group members, Lorelai Moniz, created an offshoot, which is the Engaged Movie Edition. For those of us who can't stay away from the country, this is a good option. <laughs> Since we were in a pandemic, the group was essentially born on Zoom. We meet for an hour once a month on the third Monday. We're actually meeting tomorrow, May 16th on Zoom, to discuss Marvel's Black Panther. So if you've seen that film, you're welcome to drop in and join us. For next month in June, we have been graciously, generously offered space right here at Cherry Hill in the chapel parlor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to meet in person. We will discuss Wind River. Most of the movies that we watch can either be found on a streaming service for under five dollars, but we also like to get a copy from the library if available and pass it out amongst ourselves. Some of the movies that we've seen been The Green Book, Malcolm X, American Outrage, Harriet, Black Lantern, and Just Mercy, to name a few. We really hope you will consider joining us for the book group, the movie group, or both. There's no long-term commitment. You can come when you're able. Just contact me, and I can add you to our Facebook group or 
to our email distribution list. For me, these groups have really opened my eyes to diverse perspectives that I would not have otherwise known. They've helped me become more aware of social injustices and more passionate about doing something about them. Though reading a book or watching a movie might seem like a small step forward in working to abolish racism and inequities, it provides a start for awareness, education, sympathy, and helpful tools for having important conversations that can lead to change. Thank you, Anna. And just as a side note, uh, these are two very exciting opportunities for us at Sherry Hill. There will be, pay attention to your newsletter, to your bulletins, there will be additional uh, other new opportunities for study and discussion coming up. One final announcement, our thoughts, our prayers, our sympathy are indeed with Kevin and Anna Dewey this morning as they mourn the loss of Kevin's father, Carl, this past Thursday. Many of our longtime members will remember Garth, who was a member of Cherry Hill. Uh, Kevin and Anna, please know that you are in our prayers and we surround you with our sympathy and with our a memorial service will be held here at Cherry Hill for Card on Saturday, June the 11th at 12 o'clock noon. I hope that you will be attending to that service. And now may we continue in our
I will show you what someone is like who comes to me. Here's my words and acts on them. That one is like a man building a house who dug deeply and laid the foundation on a rock. When a flood rose, the river burst against the house but could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the river burst against it, immediately it fell and great was the ruin. May the words that are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and formed by your grace, O oh God. For it is in the Savior's name that we pray. Amen. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who knows where I got the title for this morning's sermon. Beneath the edifice that men call me. Even our director of music and organist was rather skeptical when I first submitted this sermon title to him back in early April. But as always, he's done an outstanding job of finding a very appropriate anthem to go with it. It's really not something that I came up with, but rather it's the first line of a poem that I ran years ago, but I've always kept in my file because somehow I thought there might be a sermon in here somewhere. And I put the little poem on the front of today's board. Beneath the edifice that men call me, whose minarets attract the setting sun, whose portals to the passerby are free. Now, the connection between the poem and the sermon really just ends with that first line. And for some reason, I thought about this little poem as I reflected on both of our readings today. For both of our readings, the one from Paul's letter to the Corinthians and Jesus' well-known parable from the Gospel of Luke, both of our readings speak of the importance of a good foundation. A strong, sure, solid foundation. So, the idea I'd like for us to think about for just a little bit this morning is what's beneath the surface of your life and mine? What's underneath the me that you see? What's underneath the upper, visible, above ground of every human life? And then after we think about that, we'll think about perhaps what's most important of all, and that is what is the foundation of your life and mine? I'm not sure if you've ever thought about it or not, but I've come to the conclusion that you can pretty much tell a person's age by the particular words they use to describe what's underneath a house. Younger people call it a basement. Older people, my grandparents' age, used to call it a cellar. Back in the old days, there was often no stairway inside the house which led down to the basement or the cellar. In those days, you had to go down into most of them through a cellar door that was located outside of the house. A cellar often did not have a poured concrete floor. There was just a dirt floor. And the cold, damp atmosphere of such a cellar made it an ideal place for storing food or keeping your wine. The days of such cellars seem to have passed away. Today, most of us live in homes which simply have basements. You know, our basements are divided into sections for the heating system, a place to do the laundry, and maybe a work area or storage area. Some basements are so wonderfully finished and, and they're so beautiful and complete that they become recreational. 
recreation rooms, or maybe a home office, or, or maybe even an extra bedroom. They're so beautiful, they, they almost cease to be basements. But regardless of what one calls the room beneath the house, I think we can divide people into two groups when it comes to basements. On the one hand, there are those rare souls who seem to have a fetish about keeping an immaculate basement. <laughs> Anyone here fall into that category? You know, upon your first visit to their home, you're only there for five minutes and they're taking you by the arm and showing you the basement. <laughs> but on the other hand, there are others whose basements are such a disaster there that if you were to open the basement door by mistake while you're looking for a first floor restroom, they might tackle you or, or physically restrain you to keep you out of the chamber of horrors that lie beneath the house. <laughs> for those kind of people, the basement is only clean once, and that's when it comes time to sell the house. Well, enough about that. Let's get back to my original question. What is beneath the edifice of your life and mine? Well, with both of those readings we heard this morning in mind, let me share with you just two thoughts. To begin with, I've come to the conclusion that I need a large basement, a large lower beneath my life for storing and working on all the unfinished projects of my life. I simply can't even begin to imagine what it would be like to live in a house without a basement. Back in Saint Harbor, where I was before here, the manse I lived in there had this large basement with lots of storage space lots of uh, room to move around in. There was a cedar lined storage room. There was a, a large room down there which I used as, a, as an office. But, um, it was great. So I can't imagine not having some place like that. As I say that, I think of my Uncle Ben. He and my Aunt Helen lived in a large old house with one of those unfinished cellars. I was talking about. However, the cellar for Uncle Ben was a large workroom where he would make small pieces of furniture, he'd work on electrical appliances, and he always seemed to have several projects going on down in his workroom in the cellar. Sometimes I think he just went down there to get away from Aunt Helen, but who knows? Still, I remember even as a little boy going down there, and there were always a lot of unfinished things on his shelves and on his workbench. He'd been working on some of them for years, some of them he never finished completely. And I remember my dad telling me that when my uncle died, going down there it was just amazing. Well, he accomplished many wonderful things in his life. Uncle Ben still had a lot of things to work on. And I think the same thing could be said for our lives. We need a large room beneath the ground level of our lives where we can work on or tinker on projects that we haven't quite finished yet. To begin with, I think we all need some large place to store and work on our unfinished dreams. You know, we can't have all of our dreams come to fruition at one time. The best dreams require lots of working and waiting, and maybe they won't even be realized until our final days. Some dreams are so wonderful that just waiting for them, working on them, and leaving them in God's hands becomes a source of secret beauty in our lives. We shall all have some large place to store and work on the unfinished causes for which we've given our voice and our life. 
We may not win the war for truth today. We're still working on that. In our battle for all the grand causes, we'll win some and lose others. We may go to our graves with the causes hanging in the balance, but the fact that we kept it alive and we keep working on it may mean that someone who will get after us will continue it and bring it to fruition. We should all have some large place to continue working on our understanding of God and of the Bible and of God's work in the world. Today there seems to be this notion that we can know everything there is to be known about the Bible and everything that needs to be known about God. We can figure God all out. Good for them. Not for me. For this notion denies the, the very teaching of Scripture. I don't read the Bible the same way today that I read it when I was in third, fourth, or fourth, fifth grade. I don't read the Bible today exactly the same way I read it ten years ago or even a year ago. A passage might have one meaning for me today, and then tomorrow the Holy Spirit might reveal a completely different meaning. We read the 23rd Psalm last week. I've read the 23rd Psalm for years. I haven't memorized quite carefully. But every time I hear it, I hear something new. And I can never say that I have God figured out. Because every single day of my life, God surprises me with new glimpses and new understandings of how God is at work in the world in my life. I'd like to suggest that when you get to the point where you know it all, where there's no place in your mind for new ideas that you're still working on, when, when you have a view of the Bible where it's all plain and simple, when you think you know it all, you don't. And I always, I always stay on my guard when I hear people who, who have supreme confidence in the 100% correctness of all their stands and beliefs. As Leslie Weatherhead once suggested, in the mind of every Christian, there should be at least one drawer marked awaiting further light. You know, I need a large room to work on unfinished relationships. When I was a little boy, I used to have this t-shirt. It, it, was, it was light blue, as I remember, all the pretty women in it as a four-year-old. And, and it had big, bold letters that said, please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me yet. That's true for a four-year-old. It's true for a 55 or soon to be 56-year-old. And whether or not we like it, the truth is you and I are never finished. When we can't work on a relationship with another person, we may need to remember that we are dealing with a work in progress. We're all, we may only be dealing with what we see above the ground of their life. There might be whole pieces of their personhood which are a lot of the time, the reason for troubled relationships is that two unfinished people are dealing uh, with each other on the basis that that's all there is. A lot of time, we can't make it with other some people because they aren't finished yet. We aren't finished yet. No relationship is ever a finished product. Right? Whether it's a friendship, your relationship with your children, God help your relationship with your spouse. It's always a work in progress. So how sad and tragic it is to dismiss any human being or any, any human relationship because they are never finished. We're always working on them. Always working on ourselves. And maybe, maybe, the best things about me and the best things about you are still down there in the basement, awaiting completion.
conviction, awaiting further light. I have some thoughts and some dreams that I'm not ready to share with you yet. I have some things I'm working on down there. And maybe, you know, every once in a while, Uncle Ben would discover a tool or, or some project or something on that workbench that he had forgotten was even there. And maybe there are pieces of our lives hidden somewhere down there in the basement, especially if we haven't cleaned up too well lately. You just can't find them right now, but someday you'll discover them and you'll make something beautiful out of them. I would hate to think that you'd ever give up on me because I'm not finished yet. And for the same reason, I'm going to work a little harder and refuse to give up on anyone else until they are finished. So keep a large and okay, even somewhat messy basement in the lower level of your life for all the things which are properly unfinished. Because you know, when the story of your life and mine is all said and done, maybe God will not be as near you as interested in the neat, tidy upstairs of our lives, as in the grandeur of the product projects that you're still working on. Maybe keep a basement like my own bed. And then second, and maybe most important of all, regardless of what you have down in the basement, make sure that you have a strong, solid, substantial foundation to support the upper levels of your life. Whatever the appearance of your basin may be, whether it is impeccable in its order or impossible in its disorder, the most important thing is that it provides strong support for the structure above. That's the message of Jesus' parable in the Gospel of Luke this morning. Jesus tells that familiar parable about two builders. One was a wise builder and the other was a foolish builder. The foolish builder builds his house on the sand and when the rains fell and the winds blew and the floods rose, the house that was built on the sand collapsed. And Jesus said, great was the ruin of that house. But there was another builder who was a wise builder, and he built his house on the bedrock. And when the rains fell and the winds blew and the floods rose, that house stood strong and tall and proud. It was able to withstand the wind, the rain, and the floods because it had its foundation firmly built upon the rock. These words of Jesus remind us of what a great disaster it would be to discover on some day of judgment that we built our houses, that we built the edifice of our lives on a poor foundation. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul reminds us that we could build lives that appear to be fine and wonderful on the surface, but if they are built on poor foundations, they will eventually collapse. We've all seen that, haven't we? Maybe we've done it. Some people build their lives on the foundation of money, or power, prestige, or popularity, or glitz, or you name it. They'll build their life, the, the edifice of their life, on anything but the strong, sure foundation of Jesus Christ. And I think we've all seen it happen, and maybe it's even happened to us. How in time, lives that are not built will be swept away. They will not stand. 
We had a builder out in Sag Harbor who, who built homes up in the, the northern part of New York State. And he told me once that he could keep his crews busy through most of the winter if he could pour the foundations before Thanksgiving. He said that there are careless builders, I would say foolish builders, who risked pouring foundations after Thanksgiving, but he couldn't guarantee that a foundation that is poured after the middle of November in upstate New York will hold, because the chances are it might just collapse. Now, I've never known anyone who had a home in which the foundation walls have collapsed. I suppose it's pretty messy, and it's a terrible mess. Not only in the rebuilding of those walls, but everything else above that needs to be rebuilt. However, I think it would be an even greater disaster if the foundation of what I believe is my life in Christ were to collapse. What a disaster it would be to discover that all along my life was built on some sand, on some other foundation than that one sure, strong foundation of Christ. I guess it's possible that we could take, if we take Jesus' words and Luke seriously, it is possible that I might have built my life on some foundation that will not be able to withstand the storms that will inevitably come and great will be its ruin on some day of judgment. And yet, in this sobering warning of Jesus, I think there's a hopeful invitation. Today, Jesus is offering us the invitation, the opportunity to switch foundations. It seems to me that that's one thing that the gospel can offer us which no builder can offer us, at least I don't think so. Oh, I suppose it's humanly possible, and Andy or Dave can and probably will correct me on this, but uh, I suppose it's humanly possible by some kind of technology to slip a new foundation under a, under a house that has a poor one. I can't picture that, but I guess it's possible. But one thing that is surely possible whenever we hear, whenever we respond to the gospel, is that we can make the decision to switch foundations and build our on the underpinning of Jesus Christ himself, build it upon his words, his truth, and his redeeming work. That decision can be made. Well, that doesn't mean that there won't be rebuilding after that. We must never think that just because we are born anew or born again, that's going to solve all of our problems. The selection of Christ as the foundation of our life is the beginning, and it's only the beginning. And it may take years of rebuilding and renovating to put our lives together in just the right way. That's okay. That's what you have to face it. In fact, the building of our lives probably won't even be finished in our lifetime.
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We are mindful that with each blessing there is great responsibility to steward your gifts as well. We pray, O oh God, that we might learn new and blessed ways to participate in the good stewardship of your creation. As war terrorizes the nations, as people are fighting against peoples, and as fear and greed dominate world markets, may we be ever mindful of your call in our lives to be better stewards of your gifts. And may we be more mindful of you in our lives, you who call us to love one another, you, O oh God, who cast out fear in the hearts of all as you remind us to consider the lilies, you who created this world and called it good. Through Jesus Christ, break down the walls of hostility that divide us and send peace on earth. Put down greed, pride, and anger, which turn nation, and race, nation against nation and race against race. Remove hate and prejudice from us and from all people so that your children may be reconciled with those we fear, resent, or threaten. Grant that we might live together in your peace. Merciful God, you bear the pain of your world. Even as we make our prayers for peace, we still think and our hearts break over those who are suffering from war in, um, in Ukraine. And we remember them in a special way in our prayers, as well as those whose lives were shaken and shattered in Buffalo, New York, yesterday afternoon, in another senseless act of violence. Look with compassion upon them and on all those who are ill and on all those who mourn. Nurture and cheer them with your word, and bring healing as a sign of your grace. And as you stand with each of us, may we be reminded that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, will ever separate any one of us Give us faith in our praying and love in our service. That by your power we may find a new balance in living and a new victory in the midst of adversity. Yours is the morning and yours is the evening, O oh God. Let Christ's delightful world shine forever in our hearts and draw us to the light of your glory. No other is worthy of the praise we sing and the prayers that we make. And so as your son taught us, we too will pray to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.